Welcome back to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. It's a privilege to have with us today somebody from the church in Wales, formerly the Right Reverend uh, Stuart Bell, Bishop Stuart Bell. Now, let me just remind you that we do have supporters uh, from all faiths and none. We're the UK's largest pro-marriage organisation. Uh, tens of thousands of individuals and groups uh, supporting one man, one woman marriage. Yes, other things take place in society. Uh, and yes, sometimes marriages don't work out, etc. We know all that. But actually, when a marriage works, it really does bring about the best version of the next generation. And we believe marriage is that thing which only one man and one woman can do. And you'd think that would be a popular view within the church. Many of you know not so much these these days and especially not so much uh, in the church. And somebody is here now to tell us about his journey. Right Reverend Stuart Bell, uh, Bishop Stuart, uh, what a privilege to talk to you today. Uh, now, you've had an interesting time over the last couple of years in the Church of Wales. Uh, a difficult time, but actually you've, you've found something very positive out of it. I wonder if you'd take a, just a few minutes and talk us through what's been going on. Yeah, uh, um, I've been ministering in the Church of Wales for more than 50 years. I was ordained in uh, 1971 and have served uh, throughout that time in various parishes across West Wales, finishing up with 25 years in Aberystwyth. I retired from there um, after being uh, chaplain to the university students, chaplain to the hospital, and uh, responsible overall for a team of uh, clergy looking after five congregations. And um, it was a very fruitful and very, very enjoyable ministry. So we came here to live in Borth, which is just six miles north of Aberystwyth, still on the West Wales coast. Uh, we came here in 2013, and for a number of years I was helping out in a, a vacancy in the local churches, um, small, comparatively small village churches. And um, that was fine until COVID came along. Uh, when COVID arrived, um, a number of Christians locally suggested that um, because of lockdown, we would have a service on the beach uh, here in Borth during the summer. So this was uh, July time, and I agreed to participate. Mm. But it was viewed by the church authorities as something that was illegal under COVID restrictions. Um, that's a matter of debate one way or another. Um, but subsequently, my... Um, permission to officiate in the diocese was withdrawn uh, and uh, I believe to, on the back of that. So this is July 2021. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, August 2021, I received the letter from the bishop saying that my permission to officiate was withdrawn. And then mm. on the 6th of September 2021, the Church in Wales made uh, a decision which still uh, affects me quite deeply. Uh, they made the decision to allow the blessing of same-sex relationships. Yes. So this is really a, a historic decision where the Church in Wales is concerned. It is the first time ever in its history that it made a decision, a policy decision, to go against the Bible. So you've got the Bible mm. making one statement and contemporary culture making another, and the decision that day on the 6th of September was, we're putting the Bible to one side and we're going to accept mm. uh, contemporary culture. So we turn our back on the Bible and we go with contemporary culture. That's the first time. That's really absolutely mm. historic. And uh, a number of us at that point felt that uh, there was no way that we could continue to work and minister within the church in Wales. Uh, there were a number who immediately resigned. There were a number who sent back to their bishops their permission to officiate. Now, because mine had been withdrawn in the August, I didn't have to send mine back because uh, I didn't have it. But uh, where my conscience is concerned, I would have had to have done that and to say I can no longer stand uh, with the church in Wales in its new position. And my uh, view is that uh, this is a Reformation issue that is as big as the Reformation of 500 years ago, where Martin Luther stood uh, mm. and said, here I stand, I can do no other. And there are many, many mm. clergy and mm. many, many lay people who are sharing in exactly the same mm. uh, stance. Mm. So in October, 
2021, we began something which we call Fellowship 345, which is uh, um, a new congregation. We meet on a Sunday afternoon in a little village called Rita Penai, which nobody has ever heard of. In, and we meet in the village mm. hall. Uh, our service is at 3.45 in the afternoon, which is why we're called Fellowship 345. And the idea is that it is available as an additional service rather than an alternative service. So people are free to go where they want in the morning or to go where they want in the evening, mm. but they come to us in the afternoon uh, in order to uh, receive uh, teaching uh, that is consistent with the, with the Bible and to have fellowship with other people who share uh, the same convictions. So that's where we are. We've been going now for nearly two years. Mm. Well, and you've got some European links? Yes, um, I was consecrated as a bishop in the Anglican Convocation in Europe. Uh, that was in March this year. Um, mm. So I am the Anglican Convocation in Europe uh, assistant bishop with primary responsibility and care for Wales. So people of the same convictions as ourselves, yep. uh, right yep. across Wales, uh, look, look to me for Episcopal uh, leadership and pastoral care. Uh, by same convictions, you mean, actually, we, we believe the Bible and we think it's important and <laughs> we're going to follow its teachings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you've yeah, got that in, yeah. in two sentences. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It's not hard, yeah. is it really? Well, that, that, that sounds like quite a journey and quite a transition. Has, tell me, how has it, a, how has it affected your, 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 your own faith? How has it affected your own attitude towards the, the church more widely? Um, it, it hasn't affected my, my faith in a, a destructive way at all. Mm. Um, uh, we've grieved really deeply, and mm. I have I've served the Church in Wales, and I've served the Lord, but in the Church in Wales for fifty-one years, fifty-three now, if you count these last two, mm. Mm. Uh, and everything about the Church in Wales I have been committed to and have loved deeply. I, I have preached mm. extensively across this diocese. Um, I, I know the clergy, I know the system, I know the parishes, I, I know a lot of the people. Uh, and so the, the leaving has been an enormous bereavement. Mm. Um, mm. And um, the, the lovely thing is that many of those relationships continue unaffected, which is, which yep. is great. Yep. Which um, is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, how, the, how awful... Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, yeah. it's been it's been a, a great tragedy, yeah. but yeah. side by side with that has uh, come this remarkable new role of um, being an assistant bishop to the presiding bishop of the Anglican Convocation in Europe, uh, a man yeah. uh, uh, called Bishop Andy Lyons, and that's completely unexpected. And I've tried to do um, a, a web search. And the last person that I can find who was ordained in his 70s, consecrated as a bishop in his 70s, was um, a man in the United States 200 years ago. Uh, the fact wow. that I've been asked to come, come back into an Episcopal role in this way is absolutely unheard of. And, um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a tremendous new opportunity to provide pastoral care for people who are as grieving and bereaved as we have been uh, and who are looking for some new way in which they can retain their Anglicanism but also express their Christian faith within the context mm. of a fellowship of other Christians who believe the same. Mm. Uh, and so I'm the, uh, I'm the one that's providing that support and also mm. providing encouragement and help to those who are coming out of the church in Wales, and the numbers are quite substantial. Mm. And, and I can just sense in your in your voice that how how much this means to you, how passionate you are about uh, marriage, family, sexuality issues from a biblical perspective. Um, why do you think it is that that some others have seen fit to to let those things go? And and um, how can we almost steal man their 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 point of view, if you like, and 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 I suppose help. Uh, explain why they might have gone where they've gone to and, and maybe correct some so is it simply a case of well 
we just don't believe the Bible's true? Or is it some kind of uh, uh, other eccentric view of a particular element of scripture in abstract from all the others? Or why have they gone the way they've gone? Uh, th that's a massive question, Tony, and um, uh, and would take a long, long, yeah, yeah. Okay. long time to uh, un unpack. I think that mm. for many people, uh, their primary motivation is compassion, and they and they feel uh, so uh, drawn to ministry amongst the marginalised mm. and the excluded that. Um, they have bent over backwards in order to find some way in which they could accommodate people who come into that kind of category. And mm -hmm. um, there's, there's that, that's just been going on and on and on, so that, so that as each new group has been discovered uh, and has said, well, nobody's listening to me, there are, there are those in the church who've said, oh, well, we must help them too. So, uh, mm. Mm. Uh, firstly, it was uh, people with uh, homosexual uh, um, uh, uh, instincts, uh, same-sex attraction, mm. and now we've moved on to transgender issues, mm. and um, mm. whatever the, the next group that say, we're marginalized and nobody is mm. listening to us, people mm. of that kind of, of um, a, a deep compassion will move in their direction too and say, oh, well, we must accommodate these people and we must make room for them and we must provide uh, an accepting place yeah. for them. So that I think that the, yeah. that, that the motivation for many people has been compassion combined with justice. Those have been the, those have been the, the kind of two gr great things that have been presented mm. to us uh, in order to try to persuade us mm. to go in the same direction. But the problem mm. with that is that, that compassion and justice uh, 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 um, uh, cut away from truth uh, and become indulgence rather than love. And that's precisely mm. where we are. So that, we, we, uh, mm. that, that many in the church now have got to a position where they are completely uncritical about um, uh, their, their new position. And, and I almost feel that we have entered into an age of unreason where we are no longer drawing straight lines of logic between positions that we hold and attitudes yep. and approaches that we make. And in this, in this age of yep. unreason, it seems that, that some people feel that that is no longer important and that it isn't relevant uh, mm. and that we can, mm. we can provide these accommodations in, in a way that has no root whatever in the basis of our Christian authority. Of course, the basis of our Christian authority is the Bible. So, so here is the yeah. Bible, the Bible insisting uh, on, on justice and compassion, but, it, but, the, but the justice and compassion are not rootless. They are rooted within truth, mm. and they are rooted within Christ, and they are rooted within an authority that is completely unchanging. Yeah. Long answer, but it was a big question. No, 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 it, it makes, and, and, and oddly enough, it's, it's not, really that compassionate if in fact access to the kingdom of heaven is based on faith and repentance and and if 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 no repentance is taught around certain sins then in fact you you risk a very different situation of of many coming up to me and saying lord lord and and him saying depart from me i never knew you and that's not compassionate absolutely. at all absolutely um, yeah, so, so it's kind of a short-sighted compassion. And then I suppose there's the other aspect of uh, wh when I've spoken to one or two members of the clergy uh, who, who would be um, uh, holding a different position to you, let's, let's put it that way, they would say, well, actually, uh, culture is, is uh, a, as much as of an authority as the Bible, in which case, well, th that's very difficult to have a conversation about anything if the Bible is no longer the authority. Well, yes, uh, let's just follow that through for a second. Uh, culture is an equal authority to the Bible. What ha happens when they conflict with one another, which is the final authority? And of course, yep. the, the church for 2,000 years has said the Bible is the final authority. Mm. Mm. Every, mm. every denomination, uh, uh, Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, have all said the same. That the Bible is yeah. the final authority. We... we yeah. We judge culture by the scriptures. And of course, what's happening now is that uh, there is a group of people who are trying to cut loose from that. 
Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that, that doesn't mean people of all types of uh, persuasions aren't welcome in the church. That's the whole point. You know, <laughs> Christ came to call sinners uh, to repentance, not people who are perfect. So that that includes of all of us, really. So that's, you know, course. none of us are better than anybody else. Uh, and all of us are sinners. We are all sure all of us. Yeah, all, yeah. All, of us are, all of us are sexually compromised. Yes. There, there isn't one of yeah. us that lives a pure... Yeah. Sexual life right. in, in, in our relations right. prior, prior to marriage, post marriage. Yep, yeah. yep, absolutely right. But it's so the difference would be um, the the direction of of the, uh, the the soul, if you like. So, which direction are you trying to head in? Are you trying to work towards godliness, um, sanctification, uh, becoming more Christ-like, or are there areas in your life where you think, well, no, they're untouchable? Um, and it seems to me to be the case that. Uh, some people are saying, oh, yes, you can have those untouchable areas where, in fact, maybe Paul, maybe others were wrong. And in fact, they're OK. And you'll you'll still get by even though you indulge yourself in those areas because you're born this way. Uh, and to me, that mm. it just seems, well, you can apply that to almost any area of sin if you wanted to do that, couldn't you? Absolutely, you can. Absolutely, you can. Yeah. Uh, ever since ever since I became sexually aware in my teenage years, yeah. Is I have desired to be promiscuous ever since yeah. then. It, yeah. it, it is it is my nature as a red blooded man. Absolutely. I could go in, I could go into a room and tell you what I consider to be the attractive women in that room, and uh, and I could do it. Yep. And Jesus, Jesus said, didn't yep. he, that that those who look at a woman lustfully have committed adultery in their hearts. Absolutely. And it was for, yeah, for, it was former former present. President Jimmy Carter, who said, I understand what that statement is about perfectly well. And people sniggered, mm. but I understand it perfectly well. That's my nature. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, if I yeah. live according to that na nature, I would have been promiscuous before I married and unfaithful within my marriage. But the scriptures yes, called absolutely. me, the scriptures called me to deny my nature and to live a mm. life of, of, of sexual purity prior to marriage. Yeah so that I avoid fornication, and post-marriage, so that I avoid adultery. The call is yeah. one man, one woman, in harmony, united sexually for life. And of course, you know, you, uh, you approach that from a biblical standpoint. Uh, as an all, and, and myself and, and our board are Christians, but we approach it from a, a kind of a secular evidence standpoint, because if you look at all the social science, actually, if you're looking at the, the best way of bringing about the best version of the next generation, growing up with your married mum and dad in a monogamous marital relationship, from a stats point of view, brings about all the best outcomes for adults, for children, and therefore for society. Hence, maybe a government got involved in trying to promote keeping a man and a woman together for the sake of the children, for the sake of, of the next generation, if you like. And I know if, if I can maybe ask a, a personal point from your own background, um, that you grew up in a single parent family. Um, and I wonder if perhaps you could take a moment to, to, as did I in fact, but perhaps you could take a moment to tell me how that's, that's affected your views on some of these issues. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You, you speak about statistics and I can speak about anecdotal evidence. This, this yep. is my, my experience. My father died when I was 18 months old. I have no memory of him at all. My mother then raised two boys entirely alone. She gave us all the love that we could ever ask for or ever needed and because i had no experience of a father in the home my experience as a growing as a child growing up was that this was perfectly normal i didn't have any problem with it i wasn't um yearning for someone that wasn't there until until i got married and then i had no i had no model in my mind, what it looked like for a man and a woman to live together in a relationship of intimacy 24 seven. Mm. I had no model. Mm. Mm. Then on top of that, things got worse because when we had children, I had no model of what a father looked like and how he related to his children within the family setting. So I had to look to books. I had to look to the example of other people and I had to do the best that I could under those circumstances. In addition to that, when my children had children, 
I had no model of my father moving a stage further and becoming a grandfather right. as he related to me and then to my children. And so it being, being a grandfather, I've had to learn from books, I've had to learn from others, mm. and I've had to try the best that I can. So mm. everything that should have been there, and I would have wanted to be there in terms of a male adult example, the generation above me was not there. Mm. And I missed mm. it more when I became a husband and a father and a grandfather than I ever did when I grew up. Now, there was no lack of love, but what would not have made up for the absence of a father was to have two mothers. I didn't need more love. I had plenty of love. I needed a male model. I would have mm -hmm. suffered mm -hmm. equally if I had had two fathers and no mother, because then I would have had no mother figure. And that's been yep. Yep. a serious loss in my life and one that I have regretted. Nobody's to blame. My father didn't walk mm. out. He didn't die on purpose. Mm. He didn't abandon my mother. I was raised in a good home, but what I missed was a father. And that mm. was, that's irreplaceable. It's something that, that where the, there is a vacuum there in my past. And for those who say, oh, men can look after the child, or two men can look after the child, are telling an untruth the children that they bring into the world or seek to look after will always be handicapped as a consequence, mm. without any doubt. No, you're absolutely right. And we spoke to a lady called Katie Faust, who uh, has written a book and, in fact, has got an organization called Them Before Us, who looks, em again, empirically at all these things. And you're absolutely right. You know, two mums can never be a dad, two dads can never be a mum. Uh, and that's not to say, you know, sometimes as you say, awful things happen, people sadly die, uh, marriages can break down for other reasons, abuse, adultery, abandonment, all sorts of awful things. But um, in terms of w the best model, you know, which, which seems to work for the greatest amount of people to bring about the largest amount of good, you know, two people staying together, getting married and raising their kids uh, and loving them in a, in a nurturing home really seems to be the best way. Uh, empirically, yeah. common sense wise, and also anecdotally. I mean, I, I would reflect everything you've just said there. Mm. And it's, it's, it's almost, you know, it's wonderful to hear somebody else saying it really. Um, and for my own mm. marriage, I would say, you know, it, it's taken me a good couple of decades to work through some of those things, you know. Mm. Uh, but, uh, and like you say, you don't even notice them until they come along. Uh, no, so thank you, thank no. you for sharing that. That's, yeah. that's, that's lovely. Um, what would you, so your advice, there'll be many people up and down Wales and indeed outside of Wales. And in fact, you know, even this morning I had an email uh, from somebody in a Methodist church who, who with a broken heart was saying they've just got to, they've got to leave. They can't stay any longer um, because of what's happening and what's being taught in their, in their congregation. Um, and as you say, with, with sadness and mourning, uh, the, the fact that they've got to make a decision. What, what advice would you give to maybe people in other situations who just feel isolated uh, from those around them, from, uh, from the people teaching them, uh, the people giving them spiritual guidance? Uh, what would you say? How would you advise them? I think that uh, the first thing that I would say is, um, is feel the pain. Hmm. Um, we are in an astounding position now, utterly astounding. If we had been told that 20 years ago, we would need to defend heterosexual marriage and that our views on heterosexual marriage, biblical teaching mm. was now a minority view, becoming very slowly a despised view. We would have been utterly amazed. And those who had foretold that 20 years ago, we would have said, that's ridiculous. That will never ever happen. People will never think like that. Mm. We, are, we are now in a position where we need to feel the loss of that and to experience the sense of bereavement that goes with it uh, and mm. not try to ignore it or um, put it to one side as though it's something that is un un I think that, that, that in order to deal with it, we need to confront, confront it. So that would be my first position. Mm. The, the second is that um, we then should be looking for people, not who are going to uh, just uh, uh, bolster our 
views uh, and help us in the support of them, but rather to find a place of fellowship and security where we can be strong together and where the views that we hold are the views of others um, who are sympathetic towards that, that same outlook. And uh, um, mm. I would think that in just about every community, we would find congregations of that kind, if not of the same denomination, uh, then mm. nonetheless of other denominations. Uh, there are groupings mm. that are staying very faithful to Scripture and that, um, that are unyielding in that. Mm. And where we may be in a place of real isolation, then I would say we'll get to the web and see whether you can't find um, uh, an online Christian community that would give you the kind of uh, uh, support and encouragement and strengthening that uh, that you could find. Mm, that's good. And get, get in touch with either yourself or myself and, you know, we'll point you in directions of... Uh of, of things that uh, certainly will be able to help, I'm sure. I'm sure. Absolutely. I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be available to people across well, that's, Wales that's that's in lovely. order to guide, guide and direct them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, so w would, you, would you mind if we put some contact details up? What sort of contact details would you like us to put up? No, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. E would email, would, email would your, be best for email me. Email would yes. be great. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible says quite clearly, perfect peace have those who, who love God's word and, and nothing will will alarm or, or, or eternally offend them, if you like. And I know that you have, you've been through a lot. You've, the, the, the palpable kind of loss uh, comes through in your voice. But nevertheless, you found uh, an element of peace in following the truth. Uh, and, and kind of, you've, you've said other things have happened, which you know, it's, it's, it's strange that they've happened. You know, they wouldn't normally have happened and they have uh, to, to much um, great praise of God, if you like. Tell us, tell us something about the peace you now feel because you've followed the right way as you see it scripturally. Um, uh, well, there are several answers to that. There's, there's a, a statement about Jesus, isn't there? It's in John's Gospel that uh, he, he didn't entrust himself to mankind because he knew what was in man. And there, there is a sense that um, the disappointment which we have experienced, which has been absolutely massive, um, mm. the, the disappointment that we have experienced, to a large degree, is predictable. Because even the church is a, um, an institution that is run and organized by human beings. We like, we like to believe that the, that the church of Jesus Christ belongs to him, and he said that he would build it and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, that's right, but, but, it's a, but it's a very human institution. And so the disappointment yep. that I've experienced uh, is, is tempered by realism. So that would be the, the first position. And that realism then brings me a measure of peace. The second thing that brings mm. me uh, peace is the sense that uh, I'm seeking to live my life before an audience of one. And if I'm pleasing the Lord in the things that I do and say and preach, then that's enough. Um, there's, there's that um, song, isn't there, of um, I have decided to follow Jesus. And there's a verse that mm. says, though none go with me, still I will follow. And and that's long since been my position as, as a Christian leader, mm -hmm. that, that when I'm convinced that this is something that, one, is in the Bible, and two, that the Lord is calling me to, then that's uh, going to be the way. Whatever the criticism, whatever the comment, whatever the opposition, that's the pathway that I'm going to take. So I've only got the Lord yeah. to please, ultimately. And... So that would be the second point. The third is that, that the Lord really is no man's debtor. And uh, our, our prayer when we retired <laughs> 10 years ago was that the Lord would use us more in our old age than he used us in our youth. And, and I'm Great. at this extraordinary position of hmm. being interviewed by you and by having people coming to me in my late 70s mm. and saying, please, will you give me spiritual counsel and guidance? And will you help me mm. to resolve problems that are, that are life-changing mm. and massive? So the Lord is answering 
those prayers. And it's there then that I think mm -hmm. that I find the peace. Yeah. Great. And that, I, uh, that, that leads into my, my other question, which would be, you know, to talk a little bit about the positive effect you've had on people around you because of this. And, and the fact that I, I can't be underestimated. It's expected. But these days, um, it's, you know, it can't be underestimated the power when a Christian uh, a church leader such as yourself does stand for, for the word of God and makes that clear, committed stand. It has a dramatic effect. Uh, and it draws people to them and it encourages people around them. And I, I think that that in itself is a, a wonderful, positive thing. I, are there, do you have any advice for your, your fellow clergymen inside and outside um, the established church in terms of making a similar kind of stand? But this is quite a difficult question because the Lord does not guide. He guides individuals individually and yep. on the issue of should I stay in or should I come out mm. uh, varies according to the individual and the individual circumstances. Mm. Mm. Uh, it varies according to Wales and England. Um, in Wales um, it appears that the battle has been lost and with this generation of bishops in the Church in Wales, the bench of bishops, uh, there is going to be no change whatever in mm. their views mm. and they are going to push their agenda still further forward. The Archbishop of Wales, Andy John, uh, when the uh, vote was taken to uh, bless same-sex marriage, said within five years we will have same-sex marriage in the Church in Wales and everybody will wonder what the fuss was about. So he's already set the agenda for the Church in Wales and the, di the direction of mm. travel. Mm. Now, there are some, mm. some conscientious, godly, uh, biblically-based clergy who are saying, mm. I'm going to stay in the Church in Wales, come what may, mm. and I am going to yep. fight that with every ounce of my being. I am not going to be forced out. This church belongs to me. I am the inheritor of Anglicanism, and, and I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to resist every step mm. that the mm. bench of bishops takes. I mm. honor that and, um, uh, and support it and encourage it. I'm not mm. here to uh, tell people that they should leave. But what I am seeing is that more and more and more of those people who said, we're going to stay in and do the best that we can mm. to influence the church in Wales are coming to the mm. conclusion that they can't. Mm and that mm. this really is the lost cause. And so mm. some clergy have resigned and have left Christian leadership. Some have gone to um, uh, chaplaincies of various kinds where they are able to continue to offer Christian leadership but not be answerable to uh, the bishops of the church in Wales. Now, I'm very aware that things are very different in England. The evangelical cause in the Anglican Church in England is much stronger than it is here in Wales. Yes, and, yes, it, uh, is. It, yes it is. Yeah, and it may well be that they will be successful or that they will be able to press for some kind of differentiation in the, in the way in which the uh, uh, um, ministry is offered ac across the, the provinces, uh, Canterbury and York. I can't, I can't speak authoritatively for them. But nevertheless, yeah. for, for clergy anywhere to, to stand and having done all to remain standing. Oh, I absolutely. Think that's the important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Inside or outside. Yeah, for us to be, un, yeah. for us to be un, unyielding yeah. on that. Uh, the, the, yeah. the, the verse that keeps on and on coming back to me uh, is the verse, is the statement that Jesus made to Pontius Pilate, which was, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And, uh, and, and that's where we are, and on the side, we belong to Jesus Christ. And he is the one mm. who, who dominates our thinking and our views and our opinions. And he is the one yep. to whom, we, who, to whom we, we must submit, including on issues yep. of sexuality and marriage. Yeah, well, you know, can't top that really mm. <laughs> as, as advice. Um, in terms of just going forward, um, yourself, uh, us, Christians more widely, society, um, what would you say? A any advice just for people more generally uh, as to how we navigate the, the, the near future and the, the, you know, the agenda ahead of us? You know, one of the, uh, one of the things that I 
and reluctant to say, but I think needs to be said mm. to the to the Christian church is get ready for it to be much worse. Right. Because the direction of travel has been mm. unbelievable, mm. and it's not going to get better. Mm. Not under the mm. present uh, political leaders. Uh, not under the present views that are being propounded by the media. Mm. Um, mm. We are uh, being seriously misled by people whose hearts are set on anarchy and nihilism. And I don't think that it has yet been fully uncovered the depth of the evil that lies behind some of these movements. It was very, very interesting. A, a couple of months ago, uh, Radio 4 had a program called Reunion, and they got together some of the leaders of the LGBT uh, movement from about 25 years ago. And one of the statements mm. that was made by them was that the idea of gay marriage never ever entered their mind. This was what they said, mm. that they were aiming for the destruction of marriage altogether. They didn't want equality mm. of marriage so that homosexuals mm. could marry, and, and, and heterosexuals could marry. They wanted to destroy marriage altogether. What do we hear about heteronormativity now? What are they aiming to do? They want to destroy it. So that, so that we are left in a state of total gender confusion and sexual confusion. And this is anarchy and nihilism. And that voice is growing stronger by the day. And it's being promoted at government level and it's being yep. promoted by the media. And, and if we think that this is bad, just hold on for another 25 years and see yep. what it's like by then. And it's not like we haven't, it's not like we haven't seen this before, you know, in <laughs> Soviet Russia, Maoist China. Absolutely. You know, there's nothing new under the Absolutely. sun. And we know what happens uh, when, when this... When this runs Absolutely. Its and it is urgent that we take the stand that mm. we do and that, and that we do yeah. it with um, absolutely resolute and that people see that that mm. is so. And, and mm. that will draw, because there are even those who are not Christians, who share our Christian values on these whole Absolutely. issues of marriage and sexuality. Yeah. This, this, yeah. Is not, this is not the preserve just of certain evangelical uh, Christian Bible-believing people. This is, this is shared mm. very widely across, across the nation, and I hear it repeatedly. Uh, as people uh, uh, express their concerns to me. Yeah, and it's good. And I think people making a stand like you, uh, us having this conversation kind of wakes people up to the, the fact that, you know, I go up and down the country and when I talk to, I've managed to talk to thousands of our supporters, a real privilege. But the message I leave them is, is that um, we're the people we've been waiting for. No one else is coming. The established <laughs> church, the government, no one else is coming. It's up to us. Yeah. You know, we need to stand yeah. and now's yeah. the time to do it. So, yeah, yeah and I think you've you've led on that wonderfully yeah. it's just such a joy and a privilege to talk to you it's such an encouragement to yeah. hear of how you've been used and i'm just so grateful uh, bishop yeah. stuart bell for your time today thank you very much that's okay can i can i conclude yeah by commending my book to, to your viewers here it is uh, recovering his reputation uh, uh the ministry of a late developer uh, this is a book about uh, 25 years of ministry in uh, St. Michael's Aberystwyth and uh, some of the uh, things that happened to us during their, uh, the yeah. time that we were there and the lessons that we learned. Uh, it's available on yeah. Amazon. Kind no, people tell fantastic. me it's a good read. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's, let's encourage people to read that. And I think that wasn't that the biggest congregation in Wales at one point? Uh, the biggest Anglican congr congregation okay. in Wales. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Not that numbers matter, but that's quite an interesting thing. Yeah, well, listen, absolute joy and a privilege to spend some time with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, very much.